uh, uh, rather controversial talk. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the mythology of the antebellum South. You know, that is at least the hope. Uh, but we're going to be covering quite a bit of materials. Uh, if you have anything to take notes, uh, please uh, feel free to grab it. Uh, and um, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the talk uh, immediately. I want to say that, you know, the Old South and the, and the imagination uh, was a land of prosperous plantations and, and happy black slaves and large white houses and altered people who could read could write and uh, you have art and literature and, and music and uh, an economy that's based upon uh, cotton and people are happy and it's idyllic and it's beautiful and it's calm and serene and all these wonderful things and really it wasn't that at all. Uh, it was not a great place to live even at that time. Uh, we're going to be going into detail. Uh, of course, you have uh, the constant reminder that so-called free society is, ba is built upon the backs of, 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 of black slaves uh, who could be seen uh, going down the national highways and, and in chains and uh, whippings and lynchings. And uh, you have so much turmoil that goes on. And unfortunately, this peculiar institution that is understood as slavery uh, had some peculiar effects on uh, the people who defended it. Um, sorry, I hear some sounds, ambient yeah. sounds still going on. Sorry, so, sorry, I'm muting. So, okay. so what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, the very beginning. Uh, what I mean by the very beginning, not the very beginning of slavery, because that would be way too long to talk. But I do have about 55 pages here, and I'm not going to be doing that either. Uh, I'm going to go to the very beginning as in the creation of slavery or the foundation of slavery in the South and then kind of follow through. We have to do it this way. Uh, it would be wonderful if we could start from Reconstruction on, uh, but as my father stressed, you got to go from the beginning in order to understand uh, this phenomenology. So first of all, the prosperity of Virginia was based upon, well, king nicotine, right? Uh, you tobacco, smoke, uh, and that was... Uh, uh, for them, the major uh, uh, product. Well, the problem is, it is a problem, if you guys are familiar with tobacco, tobacco has a way of, of taking all the nutrients out of the soil. Uh, and so you constantly have to go to new places and plant tobacco, uh, tobacco, <laughs> tobacco, while the other soil starts to refresh or regenerate itself. And that means that tobacco has to be uh, grown in great plots of land. And that means that you have to have a lot of labor in order to uh, obviously take care of the, 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 the tobacco. Uh, so what will happen is unfortunately in Virginia, I gotta tell you something about Virginians. James Talents founded and others, it was a combination of two different groups. It was a bunch of uh, aristocrats who didn't want to soil their hands. Uh, and you had well, criminals. <laughs> so, and what they want to do is all they want to do is find gold. That didn't work out too well. So they eventually had to figure out some kind of crop, and that was John Rolfe. He's the one who came up with the idea, but it was very labor intensive. Did I just mention criminals and aristocrats? I sure did. So when a Dutch ship, I'm sorry, I'm Dutch, I feel bad about this. When a Dutch ship pulled up in 1619, uh, it had 20 African slaves, and they were sold. And that is the arrival of slavery uh, into uh, the Americas, or I should say into the uh, British colonies, because obviously it was everywhere else uh, in the Spanish colonies. Uh, so John Rolfe, uh, what happened is, is that, um, of course, uh, this really helped the economy. And they just, as the tobacco industry expanded, so did slavery. And then, of course, uh, slavery expanded into Maryland. Uh, and then uh, in South Carolina. Uh, in South Carolina, uh, it's interesting, one of the reasons uh, there is there's so much swamp land that uh, the, those who were living there, again, uh, wanted to have somebody else other than themselves doing the labor. 
And unfortunately, uh, you had uh, African slaves then uh, placed in labor in uh, what will become the Carolinas and then South Carolina. And um, uh, unfortunately, there was a high death toll as a result. They were not taking care of these slaves. And then Georgia. I know you're thinking immediately, oh, Georgia, well, obviously it's going to have a lot of slavery. Well, the funny thing is, for a short period of time, Georgia was anti-slavery. Oh, here we go. What? <laughs> I threw you off. It was found uh, by a, a philanthropists, uh, various ones, uh, including James Oglethorpe, who decided to create an idyllic colony uh, to bring in those people who are indentured servants and free them, and they can work in this paradise, uh, supposedly. <laughs> and we're going to make, uh, you know, we're going to cultivate wine. Uh, we're going to get people out of debt. Uh, this is going to be a dream come true. The other thing is he outlawed slavery. Uh, slavery was not allowed in Georgia because it was on the border with Spanish Florida, and they didn't want also slaves from Georgia to go and flee into order for them everybody please mute i can't mute everybody because it it uh, yeah. mutes james too but we got all kind of stuff in the background so it's in order for uh, they don't want uh anyway uh, uh african slaves to be fleeing georgia crossing over to spanish florida and then in turn being used as part of the soldiers to fight against uh, the English. But what happened actually was the opposite. Uh, slaves from the North fled to Georgia uh, for freedom and gained that freedom for a long time. So Georgia uh, was in a sense, uh, a place of refuge until Oglethorpe uh, left the colony uh, in 1750. At that point, slavery was allowed in Georgia. Meanwhile, to the north, uh, you have the Pennsylvania colony, uh, William Penn's great holy experiment, and those people called the Quakers. And I have to tell you, those Quakers, uh, they had a lot of influence because they naturally were against slavery, the bondage of anyone. They found themselves not very welcomed in the south, but very welcomed to the north, and many of these Quakers in turn became abolitionists uh, against uh, slavery. Uh, so that's what happened there. Now, uh, you're going to have, of course, um, uh, at, at, for a while there, uh, uh, by 1775, about uh, uh, African slaves constituted about 20% of the total population. Uh, many, you may not know this, many of slaves did not speak English at that time. Uh, still speaking their native languages. Uh, and in some cases that was encouraged to continue, a little bit of information you may not know, uh, because what it did is it made the cultural break between the owner and the slave a little bit more distant and less of a chance of them learning how to read and write. Sadly, that's a little point that I think, because interesting, it's missed a lot. Now, with the uh, American Revolution, what happened then? Uh, the you know, news in the Battle of Lexington and Concord spread rapidly, and the royal governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, uh, he said, Okay, <laughs> but you guys are against me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to tell slaves to rise up and join me, and any ones that join me will gain their freedom. And so, uh, wanting to have a slave revolt, but he made an exception. No women, no older people, no children. But if you are a male and you support me and you fight against uh, this revolution on the side of the British, then you will have your freedom. Uh, that story spread all the way across the colonies. And there were people uh, that rose up uh, and uh, supported the British. Uh, so, uh, of course, and again, they thought it was strange because he didn't free his own slaves. Uh, so why would he uh, free the others? Uh, but uh, 1,500 slaves did rise up in Virginia uh, and they fought against uh, the, um, the American Revolution. Uh, he wasn't really good on his word. I think he took about 300 home with him. But this spread in other colonies too. Once again, you're hearing information you probably would not normally hear uh, that uh, the slaves were a part of the American Revolution, 
fighting on the side of the British. We have other instances of that as well, and this continued uh, to spread. In fact, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have ever heard of Phyllis Wheatley. Now I'm giving you a name, Phyllis Wheatley. Uh, she, of course, uh, wrote in a newspaper, um, how well the cry for liberty and the reverse disposition for exercise of oppressive power over others agree. I humbly think it does not require the penetration of a philosopher to determine. What does that mean in English? Because that was really good English for that time. Um, that means is that you're crying for liberty. What about us? You know, what hypocrites you guys are being. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, she was a great writer. She was an African-American born in Boston. She was a slave known for her biting sarcasm. She was freed uh, uh, soon after her literary success occurred. But she was one of these people who are outspoken against the American Revolution because it was not inclusive of African-Americans. I want, I want that to kind of set in a little bit. Right? Here is a female. African slave who speaks up, publishes her works, and she speaks up against the revolution because it's not inclusive of her people. And I think that's one of those gems I want you to, to grab from this lesson. Is that good? You guys are going? All right, let's keep on going. Um, well, by the time the war ended, uh, as many as 20,000 uh, African Americans uh, joined the British uh, uh, and to fight against the, uh, the revolution, uh, at the end of which uh, they ended up in a place called Canada. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so let's go on. Is this controversial enough? I don't know. Let's keep going. So uh, we move on uh, to the, uh, the author of the Virginia Bill of Rights. His name is George Mason. He's a planter who owned 118 slaves. And he wrote in this Bill of Rights, he wrote that all men are by natural, by nature, excuse me, equally free and independent. All men are by nature equally free and independent. But by this, he meant only white men. Uh, in fact, many people, uh, many of the Virginian legislators uh, kind of panicked. They worried about misinterpretations that they would take this idea to mean all African Americans. Uh, and so uh, they modified it and as being just white men is to be understood as that. Uh, that was actually put into the Declaration of Independence, the qualification, but then removed. And then you have places like Pennsylvania, Massachusetts that want to add all men, whites and black, are born free and equal. So you already see uh, a difference going on between North and South. Okay, uh, so what's gonna happen uh, is that, um, um, uh, excuse me, you're gonna have various legal cases in the North that will gradually erode slavery in those areas. Uh, in 1781, a woman by the name of Elizabeth Freeman, another name to remember, Elizabeth Freeman, was the first to win freedom in the Massachusetts court, basing her case on the just passed state constitution that declared all men are born free and equal. Now, interestingly enough, it says all men are born free and equal, and she, as a woman, an African-American woman, takes that, and the interpretation is that under the idea, general concept of men, it's inclusive of women. Ah, okay. Well, what happens is she... She won the case. Yes, she did. Uh, and she was set free. That's right. And uh, this decision was even confirmed with an appeal to the court in 1783. Similar cases followed. And by 1789, because of these legal precedents, slavery was abolished in Massachusetts. Wow, people, it does matter. All right. Uh, Pennsylvania also then instituted at the same, around the same time, a gradual emancipation. Uh, Rhode Island and Connecticut uh, did it by 1784. Uh, 1785, uh, New York says we're gonna to try to get rid of it by 1799. New Jersey said we're gonna get rid of it by 1804. So it looks like the North is now going anti-slavery. Uh, of course, uh, meanwhile, 
uh, we have to face the other areas, the Constitution. Well, the Constitution, unfortunately, accepted slavery. So, in fact, um, looking through the Constitution, that's again something you may want to take note of, a Section 9 of Article 1 allowed the importation of such persons. Section 2 of Article 4 prohibited the provision of, uh, of assistance to escaping persons and required the return if successful. So our, again, Section 2 of Article 4 says that if a slave runs away, this is our, the U.S. Constitution, it, they have to be brought back, right? Uh, and of course, Section 2 of Article 1 defined other persons, these other persons, that being slaves, as three-fifths of a person for a calculation of the population of the state. They're just three-fifths of a person. Uh, are you guys horrified yet? Okay, so that's in the Constitution. Article 5, here it is, says prohibits any amendment or legislation changing the provisions regarding slave importation and others until 1808, thereby giving the states 20 years to resolve the issue of slavery. So you have this period of time, you got 20 years, and after this, you guys have to figure it out. Well, you're supposed to figure it out. Um, did they figure it out uh, by that time? And the answer is no, they did not figure it out by 1808. Meanwhile, uh, you know, tobacco is kind of like, it's destroying the lands. <laughs> So, so, you know, so slavery is not becoming as productive as it should be. And then, unfortunately, we have a new invention. Uh, have you guys ever heard of Eli Whitney? Yeah. So he invented the cotton gin. Uh, and this device was amazing. And as a result of that, it made cotton production very efficient. And now, as a result of that, this invention of 1793, South moved from tobacco to cotton. And now all of a sudden, uh, slavery was becoming even more entrenched. And now we go to another interesting and controversial topic, and that is Thomas Jefferson. Here we go. Hold your breath. Thomas Jefferson. And he owned many slaves over his lifetime. And yet Thomas Jefferson, of all the founding fathers, did more to end slavery that all the others put together. Now, this seems like a huge contradiction. So we're gonna go there right now. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, I guess, uh, let's talk about what he did uh, in as far as legislation. Well, first of all, um, uh, during his career, uh, what happened is he, he sponsored and encouraged free state advocates like James Lemon, uh, he said he believed that it was the responsibility of the state and society to free all slaves. That's a quote. Uh, but he said, he wrote, he says, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is on one scale and self-preservation in the other. So what he did is a member of the House of Burgesses of Virginia in 1769, Jefferson proposed for that body to emancipate all slaves in Virginia. You heard me. Emancipate all slaves in Virginia. He wanted to do that. They disagreed. They voted him down. Then in his first draft of the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson condemned the British Crown for sponsoring the importation of slavery to the colonies, charging that the Crown has, quote, waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery into another hemisphere, unquote. Whoa. He put this in the Declaration of Independence, and the delegates from South Carolina and Georgia refused to sign unless that provision was removed. Jefferson found another way. 1784. How many people have ever heard of the Northwest Ordinance? Raise your hands. That's right. He was the author 
of the Northwest Ordinance, and he stipulated in this that there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in any of the new states admitted to the Union from the Northwest Territory. Uh, and so, and so, in fact, he says, there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude in that said territory, otherwise then it is punishable of crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. What did he do? He created a imaginary line with the North with the, with the Northwest Ordinance that went from the Ohio Valley all the way to the Rockies. Are you guys getting this? And what is north of that area is to be free. You're seeing what he did. He's creating a space where there is freedom for slaves. There's no slavery in this area. And as a result of that, later on, for example, the Missouri Compromise and other, uh, what will happen is that he's solidifying the power of the North to work against the South. And he knew that, and he said that in his letters, that he's trying to consolidate. Without, he, without the Northwest Ordinance, we wouldn't have a Missouri Compromise. We wouldn't have, of course, obviously the bleeding Kansas situation, but we wouldn't have a strong union to fight against the South. Is this making sense? We're not done yet, all right? So what did he do also? As President of the United States, uh, he signed a bill abolishing the slave trade to be effective January 1st, 1808, and he abolished it. He got rid of it under the presidency. As I said, what did James, what did, you know, what did James Madison do? What did John Adams do? Are you guys getting this point? Of all the founding fathers, he's doing the most, and he is passionate about it, really passionate about it. You should see what his words, and you're thinking, but he's such a hypocrite. Ah, Sally Hemings, what's that? What, what, what about him owning slaves? Well, he, Sally Hemings' situation is very controversial and inexcusable. But let's talk about the freeing of slaves. He promised to free his slaves, and he didn't. Why would he do such a terrible thing? Well, here's the problem. Well, the problem is he got himself in debt. Uh, it was worth about, uh, it's about two million in debt in, in, our, in our money. Two million, that's a lot. And so what happened, he, he, he got a lot of debt from his uh, father-in-law. Obviously, his marriage to it was very short, but his father-in-law, he took on that debt. It was huge. And what happened is that his creditors were taking over his properties. So make, in a sense, he owns and yet doesn't own his property. You guys following this? You guys know the legalese of this. In debt, what happens is that uh, if he, he can't, let go or sell anything. And unfortunately, uh, in the inventory, under his debt, they listed the slaves. So that, because they're understood as property. If he let those slaves go, let's say, it's free, I want to I free you, you know what's going to happen? The creditor will just say, okay, you just gave it to us, and we're going to do deal with that property any way we want to do. Does that make sense? So he can't free his slaves because they're technically not his slaves. They're owned by the creditors. Now, he had a friendly agreement with one of them who owned most of it, and the guy died. <laughs> and he, they got this like venture capitalist monster <laughs> personality type that was really going to town. And so, in fact, it was so bad, uh, even as early as his presidency, uh, that uh, he tried to limit how much he received, uh, got rid of staff, and then they even had a fundraiser to raise money to get himself out of debt so he could free his slaves. <laughs> so, so when people say to you, he didn't free his slaves, he wanted to, badly. <laughs> so what did he do? Well, he, uh, he, he, he uh, read and write, gave them skills, uh, and then um, uh, he gave them extra income for other jobs outside the plantation because he was against the very uh, slavery that he was enmeshed in. Is this good? Did you guys learn a lot in a short amount of time? So, it's, so for him, he really wants the end of slavery because that would take care of his problem when it comes even to the debt situation. He learned a lot. That's what you get for reading all the letters of Thomas Jefferson, which I had to do in the Jeffersonian theme class years ago. Okay, let's go on. So when people say, tear down Jefferson's memorial, going, ah, because he didn't free his slaves, I go, 
you know anything about that law of the, of the 19th century or 18th century when it comes to slaves as property? Okay, moving right along. You guys having fun yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Okay, so we move on and um, okay, so uh, all right. So, oh, we covered all that. So let's talk about slavery uh, in the South. Let's talk about the South, South in general. Um, okay, so uh, the, uh, basically uh, you have these large plantations and then you have small farmers. And, uh, and you have these restrictive codes that are created uh, by the very wealthy that made it forbidden for slaves to learn how to read and write. Their movement was limited and yet these masters took great sexual liberties against the enslaved women. There was a strict hierarchy of slaves. They believed to keep the various slaves from field slaves to household slaves and other slaves, trade slaves, as very separate from each other, almost like a caste system, because uh, the, the Southerners did not want them talking to each other to interact with each other. So to divide and conquer, to keep them separate. They also tried to limit their movement because they didn't want them uh, talking amongst themselves and forming any kind of plots or conspiracies. Obviously, marriage between enslaved men and women had no legal basis whatsoever, and they separated families. Uh, there was a lot of, of punitive uh, of, uh, laws against them. Of course, obviously, dogs were even bred to especially track uh, African Americans, and uh, uh, you're going to have uh, what happens is that uh, uh, if somebody kills a slave, you know what you, what's going to happen? You have to pay for the cost of what the slave amounted to, and that's it. So if a white person killed a slave, you just okay, how much was that slave worth? And you give that to them uh, in a monetary sense. Now, of course, if a somebody who is black killed somebody who is white, the law was in many of the states to be burned at the stake. Ooh. Burned at the stake. Horrendous. Uh, three quarters of white southerners did not own slaves. Three quarters, three quarters of southerners did not own slaves. Um, and amongst those who did, 88% owned less than 20. 88% owned less than 20. Uh, so we're dealing with a very small group of people who actually have slaves. Um, and, but the sad part is, is that they did not take care of these slaves. Do you realize that uh, most scholars agree that child mortality was obviously higher uh, than uh, among, in other places uh, amongst African Americans? But it was usually around 66% child mortality. So, but in some cases, like in places like uh, Louisiana or Mississippi, uh, it was as high as 90% child mortality. 90%. We know this again uh, because uh, we have registers of people's births and we have the lists. This is just count it all up. Now we have this idea of the Southern Belle and how wonderful that is. She's wearing the hoop skirt and all the other necessities. And, and, but you know what the problem is, is that entrenched in the idea of the Southern Belle is the concept of slavery. You have the more attendants that you had around to help you with your dress, to help you with your makeup, to help you with your daily household duties, the more you are looked at as the definitive aristocrat and the elegant lady, a true lady. Uh, the more slaves you have in attendance, almost like a queen. Uh, this is not a nice thing, but somebody has to put those dresses on. And we forget that many people who are subjugated, obviously African-Americans were. Uh, moving right along, uh, you can see that, uh, oh yeah, here's something interesting. In the South, unlike the North, because it was primarily agricultural, you didn't have much of a middle class except in the cities, and much of that were immigrant backgrounds. Uh, uh, middle class uh, people of all places, uh, French, uh, Huguenots, many of them, uh, Irish, Scottish, those were the few uh, in the middle classes in these, these cities. Otherwise, it was a discrepancy between the very wealthy and the extremely poor. 
In fact, as a result, there was competition between the poor whites and African laborers for the same kinds of, of products. And so uh, you had that kind of division. The Old South uh, uh, also, of course, uh, this means that, uh, of course, there was the idea or the ideal that everybody who's successful, who is white, should have slaves. So you still have the idealism, and yet you have so many people who really don't have slaves at all. Uh, so there you, and then of course you have the other thing is a false wealth. Uh, you know, I know we take a look at the cities of the South and we we see like beautiful architecture, these old uh, pictures of Richmond and Charleston and Savannah, and Montgomery, Nashville, Knoxville, New Orleans. But you know, a lot of it was a facade. Did you know a lot of those buildings were made out of stucco as opposed to marble? You know, and this is, this is why so many of these buildings did not survive. Not only obviously Sherman and others, but I'm saying they were not their facades. It's a it's a superficial wealth in many cases, and even some of these plantations, some of them still stand today. The materials are not always the best, uh, because with the North, meanwhile, they did have a lot of revenue coming in, and the North was based upon obviously trade and and merchandise and so forth. And so as time went on, the North became more and more wealthy. The interesting part is, is the South could have become more wealthy too. Another point I want to sink in, it could have become more wealthy. But the problem is, is they would not get rid of their peculiar institution. They held on so much to this ideal, uh, this, this agrarian uh, utopia, so to speak, that they did not follow the same practices as the North and they became further and further behind, but with it, they became more and more dependent upon slavery uh, to support that system. They should have changed in the 1790s and 1800s, 1810, but they didn't want to change their traditional ways. They wanted to stay with their status quo kind of lifestyle, they wanted to play it safe. Uh, a lot of historians uh, say they could have really involved themselves in manufacturing and, and done other things, uh, diversify their labor, but they didn't. And unfortunately, the institution of slavery held them back. So there you go, but we move right along. And that is, uh, let's just get to 1819. We're, we're doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, 1819, good, uh, under James Monroe, uh, Missouri comes knocking at the door. <laughs> it's like, hey, we want to be a state. Oh, great. Well, the problem is, is that um, uh, uh, they wanted to be admitted as a slave state. The House of Representatives uh, threw a monkey wrench into the plan uh, of the Missourians by passing an amendment. It decreed that no more slaves should be brought into Missouri and also provided for the gradual emancipation of children born to slave parents there. You can see already we're going to have now a big fight going on because, uh, well, having Missouri as a free state throw, sorry, it throws everything off. It throws what off? You're going to find this way too familiar when it comes to American politics even today. So there we go. Uh, it's a problem with the House of Representatives as opposed to the Senate. The House of Representatives is based upon population. The largest populations, of course, are in the North. So that means that uh, in the North, when it comes to legislation, you know, they can really push through things in the House of, 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 of Representatives. But in the Senate, it's done, of course, you guys know, you know the drill, two senators from each state. So at this point, it's equal. The Southern slave states and the free states are equal in the Senate. Admitting Missouri into uh, as, a, as a free state would throw off the balance and the South feared it would hurt them with their peculiar institution and their way of life. Because already there are problems, as you can see in the North, and, and those, of course, where abolitionists are gaining more power. So they have to make a deal. 
And what we come up with is called the Missouri Compromise. Missouri Compromise of, of okay, in 1820, as put together by Henry Clay of Kentucky. And so it admitted Missouri as a slave state, but then it, it created a new state out of Massachusetts, cut off a little part of it, and they called that a big part of it, and they called that Maine. <laughs> so now you got Maine on one side, and you got Missouri, on, and it, it balanced things out. And so that worked. But they made another rule based upon the Northwest Ordinance. Oh, yeah, you mean Thomas Jefferson? Yes, based upon that, they made a line that's called the 3630 line that divided it up, and all the states to the north are to be free, and all the states to the south are to be slaves. This is making sense. You guys getting the big picture. And you can see why. But meanwhile, guess who's speaking up saying, oh no, there's going to be a civil war over this. Little, okay, look at the dates, okay? I mean, this is, this is 1820. Thomas Jefferson <laughs> declared that there's going to be a civil war over this. And he said, quote, fire bell in the night is, is a part of all this, of what's going on. So watch out. Interesting, he was right. He's saying, and this of civil war, of course, from Jefferson's point of view, will be over slavery. And by the way, that's the viewpoint of Andrew Jackson, which we'll get to in a few moments. Is this interesting? So wait a minute, Dr. Riefeld, why are you telling me all this? Oh, wait, don't they tell you that they call civil war the war between the states? And it's over oh, states' rights. You've been lied to. <laughs> it's always over slavery. <laughs> and you're seeing it all over the place. You're going to see, oh, I got, I got so many pages on this, but we're going to summarize, but you get, get the point. And they're always talking about slavery as the main issue. Constantly. All of them. And all of them, don't worry, I'll give you names for all of them. Here we go. Keep on going. Okay, so here we go. Here's the tariff of 1828. Here we go. Uh, it's called the Tariff of Abominations. It set a 38% tax on 92% of imported goods. You heard me, a 38% tax on 92% of all imported goods. Does that make England very happy? No, it does not. No, no. But this was viewed as protecting the industries in the Northern United States who are driven out of business by the low price import goods. In English, basically, the English are selling cheaper things than the Americans can buy. <laughs> so let's raise the tariff. Well, the problem is, is that the English and others are buying tons of cotton from the South. Oh, well, now that we have this, we can't afford, because of the higher tariffs, so we're going to buy less cotton from the South. In fact, I think we're going to put tariffs on our own. And of course, the South, being not as wealthy, will have to pay those tariffs. This is making sense. And so what's going to happen is this is looked at as an attack on the South, on the coarse cotton, and on our, quote, peculiar institution. Now, who said that? Well, it happened to be the Vice President of the United States. Oh, oops. Yeah. His name is Don C. Calhoun under John Quincy Adams, and he was angry because he saw this as an attack, as what, on the institution of slavery. Uh, he described this peculiar domestic institution of the southern states, um, and of course, uh, he was pretty upset. Uh, so, <laughs> you can see where we're going with this. Uh, uh, so, what will happen is that um, Andrew Jackson becomes president, and they're all thinking, well, Andrew Jackson, he supports states' rights. You know, what could possibly go wrong? I mean, absolutely, you know, nothing could go wrong uh, because he likes states' rights. Well, what happened is that the, the fight continued uh, back and forth, uh, and there was a particular senator. Uh, his name is Senator Robert King of South Carolina, and they decided uh, that, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this, uh, Calhoun, uh, because he was so upset, uh, he stepped down as vice president of the United States, and he said something that was pretty messed up. Uh, he said that, well, we're in the South, we in the South are not going to accept this, this abomination 
we are going to nullify it. That's right. Nullify it. We are not going to accept the federal government. We're going to nullify this and secede if they force it upon us. Wait, this is over slavery. It sure is. Oh, okay. So uh, they're hoping that uh, Andrew Jackson will play ball. Uh, and here's Hain also uh, proclaim the idea that this, well, that this uh, tariff is not let go, then we are going to, well, nullify it. And then all of a sudden, this man by the name of Daniel Webster, he rises up and he says, a great orator. Uh, and he speaks up against this idea of nullification and seceding. Uh, he made this great speech. He says, if each of the 24 states was free to go its separate ways in obeying or rejecting the federal laws, there will be no true bond of union, but only a rope of sand. And he ended his speech by saying, liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable. And that speech was a bestseller. <laughs> they made 40,000 copies of it that spread all the way through the North. And all these people read this idea of a union held together, excited about that. You know, one guy was really excited about it. Uh, uh, he was 21 at the time. He, uh, he was moving from Indiana to Illinois, and his name is Abraham Lincoln. He read this and said, yes, we are a union. We must stay together as one. And now you're understanding the context of that time. And so, and so the South is already wanting to secede from the United States or nullify ideas based upon their agrarian understandings that are obviously intricately connected to the institution of slavery. It's not states' rights. They see it's an attack on their or on slavery. Well, meanwhile, let's go back to Andrew Jackson. So what happened here uh, is that they have a, uh, they're going to try to get Andrew Jackson to go for it. So they're going to make a toast because, you know, he's a state's rights advocate, right? And, uh, and they're going to toast him. And in that room, of course, is uh, Calhoun. And uh, he knows ahead of time what's going to happen. And they're going to toast the, to the idea of state's rights. So they all go into the room together. He walks in. He looks at them. He, he says, I, as president, will make the first toast. He says, our union, it must be preserved. Everybody's like, uh, okay. Uh, uh. And so, you know, and of course, uh, 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 Calhoun uh, said quietly, the union next to our liberty most dear. And people just kind of looked off and they disassembled. And that was the end of that. So they came up with another tariff. Don't worry. Let's see where we're going here. Tariff 1832. It was supposed to be a nice compromise. But you know what? South Carolina says, forget it. And so on November 24th, 1832, South Carolina nullified both the tariff 1828 from 1832 and prepared for succession from the United States based upon that peculiar institution. Is this, is this kind of getting in? This is interesting, right? So what happened there? Jackson sent U.S. Navy warships to Charleston Harbor and threatened to hang any man who worked to support nullification or secession. <laughs> what do you think? So this is definitely coming to blows. So when, I, when people kind of go say, ah, oh, you know, the South, you know, they, they, they just, they didn't really take secession really seriously and nullification, this whole thing about slavery. It's states' rights. Hello, Navy warship going into the harbor. I think this is making sense. Is this helpful? Getting the picture of what's going on. There's a compromise tariff that's kind of forced down everybody's throat. Uh, but Jackson says on May 1st of 1832, he writes, quote, you want to write this, this quote down. The tariff was only the pretext, and this Union and Southern Confederacy, the real object. The next pretext will be the Negro or slavery question, unquote. You guys got that, 1832. 
Andrew Jackson cutting through. If anybody says states' rights, if anybody says, hey, you know, it's war between the states, maybe you want to quote Andrew Jackson to them. Is this good? All right? No, he, he knows this is going to happen. And he, call, he even uses the word confederacy. <laughs> I mean, you know, if, so, this is, so this is a known factor. So what happened in the Civil War was already on its way. Are you guys seeing that? Right? And you can see the difference of culture. Of course, you're going to have things like the Wilmot Proviso, uh, which again, obviously, after the Mexican-American War, uh, you have the whole contest going on that this area should be free, and then the other people say uh, it should be a, a slave state. So, you know, you're going to have that going on there, and uh, Zachary Taylor, and then you're going to have Millard Fillmore, because uh, Zachary Taylor, he lasted four months, uh, but Zachary Taylor, uh, he came up with this, of course, Compromise of 1850, in which California was admitted to the Union as a free state, while New Mexico was granted territorial st status. But the most important thing is, is that uh, the slave trade of Washington, D.C. was abolished, but they created a Fugitive Slave Act, a Fugitive Slave Act that had to be defended in the North. That's the agreement. We'll give you California. Hey, we're, most of us are here, uh, but you know, you guys have to enforce the fugitive slave law. Meanwhile, South, they were trying to find a new slave state. And this will throw you off. They wanted to have Cuba, take a look at this, as another state for the United States to be entered into as a slave state. All right. So now you have a you have a, the fugitive slave law. Well, as a result, you have something called the Underground Railroad. We're, we're covering quite a few wonderful topics in a nice nutshell, aren't we? Yeah, the Underground Railroad's coming about, right? Uh, and um, in order to sneak slaves from the South, through the North, and into Canada. Well, okay, so there's this, it's basically a chain of stations, anti-slavery homes, through which passengers or runaway slaves were spirited by conductors, usually abolitionists, uh, to sanctuary, so like Logan's Run, all which is Canada. Uh, so you'd be free to get out of there. Well, the Southerners want, to, want a stringent law against this because they are losing so many slaves to this underground railroad. How many slaves? They're losing 1,000 slaves a year out of 4 million. What? Wait, 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 go back. Wait. They're losing a thousand slaves a year when they have four million? Dr. Riefeld, that's not that much. I know. So, so why do they press this fugitive slave law? Because the Southerners said, we're going to defend it on principle. What? That's how invested they are in slavery. They, they should just gonna, you know, cut, it off, cut it off as a loss. <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, I mean you know, but unfortunately, uh, they wanted to press this idea uh, that, uh, you know, obviously that they should have their slaves. But what's more? Then we get to Franklin Pierce. Oh, awful. He basically, he's a kind of a, a pre-Confederate <laughs> president of the United States, uh, very sympathetic with the South. Um, his cabinet contained uh, a future of the Confederacy. <laughs> For example, Secretary of War. Jefferson Davis, you guys heard of him before? <laughs> the future uh, president of the Confederacy. He is, he is the, one of the worst presidents in the United States, in, in the US history. Anyway, so what happened is Senator Douglas uh, came, arose at this time, and uh, he said that we need to come to a situation, an agreement on Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, and he, he proposed that, oh, that uh, well, Kansas, uh, uh, should be uh, a slave state, uh, and Nebraska should be a free state. But let's let the people decide, says uh, Douglas. <laughs> that became a mess. That became the Kansas-Nebraska bill. Uh, and what happened is, is that now this area is contested constantly by both sides. Uh, long and the short of it is, is that as a result of this, the Missouri Compromise was deemed as unconstitutional. Oh, no. 
Now we lost. The, now we're now all of a sudden, uh, uh, many of those uh, in the South think we can now expand slavery everywhere. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Uh, the main group that fought against this, uh, they will become, they form a party, and that party is called the Republican Party. That's where it came from. It arose against discrimination. Uh, it, it arose in favor of black lives and in favor of freedom and equal, equality for all. That's something you probably want to know. They were, the, they were the ones who are all about equality. And things changed, moving right along. So something else that we need to remember. Okay, so meanwhile, you're gonna have uh, uh, this, uh, one famous orator. He's known as Henry Ward Beecher. Uh, he was a minister and an abolitionist. And his, his sister wrote a work, uh, Miss Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote a work uh, called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And you can see what's going to happen here with Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, basically, uh, this will show the abuse that's going on uh, uh, in slavery uh, and how people are treated. This work spread throughout the North of the United States, became a bestseller, not only in the North, but in Europe. In fact, it's interesting, it was a bestseller in England and both London and Paris seem to be leaning towards the Confederacy for financial reasons. But the people who read the book in France and England were on the side of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. They were on the side of, of, you know, of, of those uh, who were wanting emancipation. And it's one of those reasons why uh, England did not fully support the Southern uh, states in, during the, uh, the Civil War. It was because of this. Well, obviously, uh, the South condemned that vile, wretched in petticoats, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and Abraham Lincoln, uh, he, he greeted her and said, so you're the one who started the Civil War. <laughs> I tell you, a book is a powerful thing. Uh, and so once again, we're back to applications for today when it comes to media, right? We have to remember that uh, writing things are important. Something else happened beyond Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, there was a, another work uh, that was written, uh, and that is uh, by Hinton Rowan Helper. Hinton Rowan Helper. And the reason why that book is important, he came out in 1857. He is a non aristocratic white person from North Carolina. He was very prejudiced uh, to uh, African Americans. But he also uh, talked about the plight of the whites and how they are suffering in, uh, in the South, how terrible it is to live there. And so uh, what happened is this book was forbidden to be published in the South. This became the spread throughout the North. So those people who are more prejudicial uh, in the North embrace this particular work, saying, well, I guess this institution is not working out. For, for obviously having to do with people who are of, of white shade. Meanwhile, Kansas is getting worse. Uh, you have, uh, uh, so what's going to happen is everybody is trying, since we have to decide uh, Kansas through democracy, uh, through whoever gets there first, uh, you're having people who are slave people running into Kansas. You have people who are anti-slave people running into Kansas, trying to fill up the population so they can vote as much as possible. Uh, you have these abolitionists uh, saying, ho for Kansas. And they carried uh, the new breech loading sharps rifle, which they nicknamed Beecher's Bibles. <laughs> you just can't make this up. Right. Okay. And they said, we crossed the prairie as of old. The pilgrims crossed the sea to make the West as they the East, the homestead of the free. Uh, and as a result, of course, you're going to have a big crunch, bleeding Kansas. And in the middle, unfortunately, you got John Brown, who did kill people indiscriminately for the sake of anti-slavery, which really made things worse. Uh, so basically, it's kind of like, hey, we don't really want this guy on our side <laughs> against slavery. And he's destroying things. He's killing people, murdering people without provocation. We're talking a bad name. It's like, no, no. But unfortunately, the South grabbed this character, John Brown, saying, hey, hey, he must be. He's got to be a hero. 
uh, but uh, unfortunately that made things worse. Then you have James Buchanan and the Dred Scott decision, and this is terrible because what happened is Dred Scott was brought uh, enslaved. Uh, he was brought into the Wisconsin and Illinois territories, and uh, and uh, he decided to run away. He was supported by abolitionists, and it came to the Supreme Court, and they said no. He uh, slaves that are brought over uh, into the free states, they are still slaves, and then it declared that slaves are just property. Uh, and you can see uh, the Civil War erupts, and then we get, uh, of course, and we'll talk about the whole Civil War, but you have Abraham Lincoln. Let's take care of the Abraham Lincoln question, because people say Abraham Lincoln did not do enough. We're going to take care of that right now. Here he goes. Abraham Lincoln, he issued his Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. Now I'm going to quote my father on this one. Uh, he declared forever free the slaves in those Confederate states still in rebellion. The blacks in the loyal border states were not affected, nor were those in specific conquered areas in the South. Lincoln's pen, a legend to the contrary, did not formally strike the shackles from a single slave, much less four million slaves. Where the president could presumably free slaves, that is, in the loyal border states, he refused to do, unless he increased the spirit of disunion. Where he could not, that is, in the Confederate states, he tried to do. In short, where he could, he would not, and where he would not, he could. <laughs> you guys got it? <laughs> Yet, at the same time, some official liberation took place at once. Because you see, wherever now, let's follow this, Lincoln arrived, or I should say, the, the, the Union emancipated, wherever they emancipated from now on into the South, those slaves were instantly free and joined the Union Army. So as they conquered, more and more people achieve their freedom. So the Emancipation Proclamation really does free slaves, but as they move and work south. Are you guys getting this? And so this is where you see lots of movies where they're, they're having a situation where when the Union Army comes, comes, comes across, all of a sudden the slaves are saying we're free. They are free uh, because the Emancipation Proclamation says they are free. As soon as the Union Army conquers that region, they can, they can even join. Uh, the Union and fight. Now, what about this border state situation? Don't worry, Abraham Lincoln's really shrewd, but he doesn't give any credit, and I'm going to take care of this, but oh, by the way, I want to give, before, I want to give you a response by the South uh, to him doing the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. This honest old Abe, when the war first began, denied abolition was part of his plan. Honest old Abe has since made a decree the war must go on till the slaves are all free. As both can't be honest, will someone tell how, if honest Abe then, he is honest Abe now? And so these are some of the ditties and songs that went around. Uh, but what he did is that he uh, issued the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Here's the date, still president, still alive, February 1st. 1865. Freedom for all. It abolished slavery altogether. See, now I'm undoing all these people who are saying, yeah, he didn't do a mass spatial proclamation. He didn't do enough. No, no. He abolished it completely. I gave you the date. You want to write that down because people always say the contrary. In fact, recently I heard some people say that when they're, when they're approaching the Lincoln Memorial, say maybe we should tear this down because he didn't do enough. I just want to say, um, no, he did it. He just, you didn't know your history. <laughs> so he did issue it. Uh, and he said it before a large crowd gathered before the White House. He said, this amendment is the king cure for all the evils. It winds up the whole thing up. It is fitting, if not indispensable, adjunct to the con consummation of the great game we are playing. I cannot but congratulate all present. And there's somebody in the audience when he declared that and said that this man must die. And his name was John Wilkes Booth. 
that's the moment where the plan came about. You guys learning things? So again, over slavery. Are you guys getting this point yet? It's slavery, slavery, slavery. I'm undoing all these years of indoctrination that we get all the time. So the 13th Amendment came into full effect on December 6, 1865, when Georgia became the 27th of the 34 states to ratify it. And there you have it. And then Abraham Lincoln was soft. He said, with malice towards none, with charity to all, firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. He's all, let's play my favorite song. Let's play Dixie. What? What is he doing? He's trying to make peace as much as possible because he sees the union as once again uh, forgiven. And he comes up with a 10% plan of amnesty and reconstruction under which any rebel state could form a union government whenever a number equal to 10% of the population who voted in 1860 would make an oath of allegiance to the Constitution and the Union, then they would receive presidential pardon. That's very fair. So basically, you know, we're not going to occupy you anymore after the, after the war. If only 10%, only 10% of your population swears an oath of loyalty to the United States. People are upset at him. You're too lenient. We need to bring things together, people together. He said the Civil, he said the civil War demolished so much he was upset. Obviously, he died before the final end. And so now you have 4 million former slaves that are free. Where would they go? And, of course, you're going to have, unfortunately, uh, what will happen, obviously, who will be the major party that the slaves will want to join? The Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln. That would be obvious. But, unfortunately, you have a bunch of disgruntled Southerners who did not want to do any forgiving or forgetting whatsoever. Now we're going down the darker path. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, and so uh, you're going to have, I know I did a sum up, but I want to make sure I get to these ideas. Uh, go through here. So what will happen uh, is, of course, you have the Freedmen's Bureau uh, that, was, that was created uh, in order to rehabilitate uh, uh, the now freed slaves, uh, give them a plot to live on, uh, a place to live, uh, food, and so forth. But the South wasn't too happy about this. And many of those Southern generals uh, came together, along with others who were part of the institution to take care of these slaves. Uh, in the South, uh, now let's talk about police just a little bit. Uh, you know, when it comes to a police force, you got sheriffs, you got marshals. It's pretty mixed up. It's all over the place uh, when it comes to enforcement. Uh, and police uh, really kind of became more organized in the North before the South in places like Boston and New York and Chicago and so forth. And that's great. But in the South, unfortunately, what happened is, remember those people who rounded up slaves? They were an official institution. In many of the places like in Mississippi and Louisiana and in Georgia, they simply says, oh, guess what? You're our new police force. That was it. Same people, new responsibility. This is what's happening during this time. Are you guys getting this? So already you have in 1865, 1866, 1867, a police force that's entrenched in anti-slavery in the South. It's the same people. And then the sense of succession, succession where Dad is a police officer now with that kind of responsibility. And now the son follows, and the son after that, and the son after that. So you have the entrenching already starting there. That's one of the interesting roots. Uh, and so now the black coats and the Jim Crow laws are going to be supported by the police in a very natural way in the South. Different story in the North. So this is not, this is not a police situation there. I'm talking about the South in that context you have an entrenched police force already at that time. Uh, and uh, it's pretty upsetting. Uh, but uh, you also have a bunch of upset Southern generals uh, who did not want to forgive and forget. One was known as Nathan Bedford Forrest. And a whole bunch of them got together and they said, we're going to do this ourselves. Uh, and they're called the Ku Klux Klan. And so they formed. Uh, in, in, uh, between 1865 to 1866, uh, the, the, the word uh, actually could derive uh, from kuklos, which means circle in Greek. Uh, and they started going around 
and harassing people uh, and burning people's homes uh, and various assaults uh, were created and riots and there were murders and it continued. In fact, um, uh, in fact, generally uh, in North and South Carolina, for example, uh, in the 18 months from, from June, uh, basically, basically from the end of the Civil War to June of 1867, there were 197 murders and 548 cases of aggravated assault in those areas that are caused by them. So it, there are very, we have the numbers. They are very real threat. They are killing people, okay? And so uh, it gets worse, of course, uh, as time goes on. Uh, you're gonna have, obviously, uh, now there's gonna be moves in order to limit uh, the freedom uh, that the the, Af the 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 blacks have in this area, uh, and so um, uh, let's go here. The black codes, which were passed between 1865 uh, to 1866, and what happens here is that the uh, uh, blacks did recognize were recognized to have common law marriages uh, that were now legitimate. Uh, it was now acceptable acceptable for black testimonies in trial to other blacks, but not to whites. So if you're black and there's a trial, you can testify to other people who are, who are black, but not to anybody who is white. Vagrants were punished with severe fines and could be sold into private service if unable to pay. So, well, hey, all this land was destroyed and open. And so, yes, you have people who are moving in and they're settling here. If you happen to be black, we'll say, hey, you know, you're a vagrant. Uh, uh, so and so once owned this land, and now I got this property. So, um, uh, since you're a vagrant, you gotta leave your home. If you don't, then guess what? You're gonna have to work for me and service me. Wait, that's slavery again. You got it, slavery all over again. Uh, under the so called apprentice laws, courts bound thousands of black children, orphans, and others whose parents were deemed unable to support them to work for planters as their guardians. So they're still separating families. Is this, is this appalling? This, yeah, it's pretty upsetting. And of course, uh, they made laws, for example, Mississippi, that if you were white and the company of somebody who's black, uh, you were fined and punished and faced jail term. So even socializing with people who are black was punishable for those. Uh, the black codes, many people said, did not go far enough. Unfortunately, uh, you're going to have uh, the United States then respond to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Are you guys appalled yet? When people talk about entrenched racism, am I really answering the question? Is this good? You, we're not even done, but I think you're getting the idea. Uh, in the Civil Rights Act of 1866 uh, is a response to the Black Codes. Uh, and basically, uh, it said that uh, they can vote freely, uh, they are equal. Uh, all persons born in the U.S. were citizens quote, with the full benefit of the laws. Uh, it granted full citizenship to native born blacks. Uh, it also guaranteed African Americans the right to full and equal benefit of all the laws and proceedings for the security of persons and property as, joined, as enjoyed by white citizens, unquote. President Johnson, who is a nightmare, who's also one of the worst presidents, vetoes it. No way. In fact, he says, oh, he's all, no, we can't have this. So, uh, and of course, it comes back again, and it gets vetoed. And then, of course, this, uh, the um, Congress uh, overwhelms him. He also, it becomes the 14th Amendment of June of 1866. And again, uh, proclaimed that no state shall deprive any of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. And of course, goes there again. Andrew Jackson kept fighting it, uh, and uh, and indirectly, they obviously uh, tried to impeach him, and impeach him because of his status. Well, okay, you guys are following this along. I know I'm looking at uh, uh, by time, and I'm trying to make sure we have enough time for everything. And I think we will. Just know Andrew Jackson bad move. Okay, so uh, let's talk about this. You, everybody talks about Andrew, uh, Ulysses Grant, and they always say, uh, he's the worst president. You know what? This is really sad. 
He is not the worst president. He did have a very bad cabinet, especially the latter half of the duration uh, of his second uh, term. But the reality is, is that, you know, why is there such a monumental uh, uh, tomb for dedicated to Grant in New York? Because people loved him at that time. Why? Because he was so pro-Reconstruction. He was so for African Americans and their rights, and he became the first victim of the Southern uh, need to change the facts, alternative facts, so to speak, and to demonize him and to make him into the worst president. He did so many things to fight for African Americans, and we have swallowed hook, line, and sinker that he's a bad president based upon this deconstructionism. Is this interesting? We still buy it to this day. Okay. So the very first thing he does uh, is he urged the ratification of the 15th Amendment. He says the question of suffrage is one which is likely to agitate the public so long as a portion of the citizens of the nation are excluded from its privileges in any state. It seems to me very desirable that this question should be settled now. And I entertain the hope and express the desire that it may be by the ratification of the 15th article of the amendment to the Constitution. And he says, he says, calmly without prejudice, hate, or sectarian pride, this has to be done. And he said this with his inaugural address with full power. And of course, does he? Yes, he does. The 15th Amendment to the United States prohibits the federal and state government from denying a citizen the right to vote based on the citizen's race, color, or previous conditions of servitude. Uh, he pressed through other measures as well. By the way, he created something called the Justice Department. Maybe we've heard that. Yeah, he's the one who did it, to enforce these ideas, especially in the South. He was the president who did that, uh, to enforce these federal laws. Meanwhile, of course, in, in anger, the Ku Klux Klan rose up uh, and others to fight against him. And this, this evil man, this monster they declared uh, he was. Uh, and they started to express the idea of the golden era, and the Ku Klux Klan, in reaction to Grant, started to do their raids once more, uh, and, and attacking African Americans, burning people's homes, and yes, murdering people. Uh, so what happened is, is that Grant declared the Enforcement Act, and the Enforcement Act of May of 1871, uh, he went off and he arrested the Klansmen. Do you guys know that? He attacked the Klansmen. He saw them as, as well, to use a modern language, a terrorist group. He saw them as uh, going against the United States, uh, going against the federal as well as the state government. Uh, and uh, these, these Ku Klux Klan members were also uh, not allowing people to vote and doing and scaring people, keeping them to their homes and circling about. But as of 1872, the Ku Klux Klan and their power collapsed to federal agents and troops. Is this interesting? Is this, yeah, it's like Ku Klux Klan rounded up to die for a period of time up until 1877 when Reconstruction ends. And so there you have it. Meanwhile, uh, he's uh, pushing the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which guaranteed African Americans equal treatment in public accommodations, public transportation, and to uh, prohibit exclusion from jury service. Uh, and so he pushed that. Unfortunately, later on, after 1877, this became the very first uh, uh, rights, Civil Rights Act to be attacked by the South. Uh, and it was declared as unconstitutional in 1883, pushing the agenda that it is separate but equal. Is this fascinating? Yeah, so here we go. So the compromise of 1877, here's the end of Reconstruction. Here's where the mess happens. You have, uh, in 1876, Ruther Hayes, the Republican candidate, and Samuel Tilden, the Democratic candidate. It was a hard call who won the election. Tilden had 184 electoral votes, and so the Democrats get one vote too short, no majority. The Republicans claim 19 doubtful votes in Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina. Both claimed Oregon. When it came down to votes, the South had committed all the fraud, by the way, in general. Huh, I wonder. Huh? Yep, things haven't changed. Anyway, the Democrats uh, took the election in many ways, so a deal was made. 
Let the Republicans win if they leave the South alone. Let the Democrats win if they leave the South alone. That's what happened. And so Hayes became the next president. He withdrew federal troops from Louisiana and South Carolina. They rescinded the enforcement acts and well, the South is winning. Everything turned side. And now we're getting into the era of Jim Crow laws and other things. I do want to talk about, I know we have about uh, 12 minutes, but I want to make sure that we cover certain areas. Now, these people in the South, many call themselves the Redeemers and claim they were to replace bayonet rule with that of home, uh, of, um, uh, sorry, of home rule. Also have those called the Bourbons, a ruling dynasty of old money that rises in the 1880s. Henry Gaddy was one of its members, and they are the ones uh, who pressed again for the repeal of, of many of the actions of Ulysses S. Grant, as well as Abraham Lincoln. They make the Mississippi Plan of 1875, uh, even though it occurred before 77, they reapply it, uh, and it now sticks in the books. And basically that means that blacks have to provide the voters, uh, sorry, that voters had to pass a literacy test, had to pass residency requirements, and were to pay a toll pack, toll, toll tax. So as you can see from this, is that many of those who were recently emancipated, they didn't have money to, to pay a poll tax. Uh, they also had a grandfather clause. They said, hey, you know what? You can vote as long as your grandfather uh, you know, voted you know, in 1860. It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, they were slaves. They didn't have a grandfather that voted that. And so you can see what they did, and of course, literacy tests and see if you're able to, to read and to write right there and then. And so they effectively uh, took out uh, what's it, back, back, back to the point where by the time you get to 1890, only 20% of people who are African Americans were able to vote in the South. Let that sink in. It fixated. They repressed the black vote. And of course, meanwhile, the Civil Rights Act was was uh, withdrawn. Plessy versus Ferguson, of course, he, the beginning of separate but equal. And then we have the rhetoric. Here comes the rhetoric. So we're going to give you names of rhetoric, and we'll probably end our last 10 minutes on this. Okay, here it is. Gary William Gallagher. Hey, I gave you a name. Um, sorry, 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 that was messed up. I'm gonna give, forget that name. We'll go to another one here. Uh, I, I want to stress another name. Uh, we'll, we'll do Edward Pollard here. Edward Pollard. Edward Pollard. Yeah, the other name's too controversial. Edward Pollard, he wrote a book called The Lost Cause, A Southern History of the Confederacy. He wrote 1866. He is the one who first coined the word lost cause. Uh, and he said that this was, of course, a severely just account of the war. He says it's against the false schools of public opinion that are sympathetic to the U.S. South. He dismissed the role of slavery in starting the war. And uh, even the fact that it was cruel at all. Okay, this is going to be hard for me to read. So I just want to tell you, I'm reading this. I disagree with it. But you want to hear his own words? Is this helpful? So here we go. He says, this is, this is like a bestseller in the South. We shall not enter upon discussion of the moral question of slavery, but we may suggest a doubt here whether that odious term slavery, which has been so long imposed by the exaggeration of Northern writers upon the judgment and sympathies of the world, is properly applied to that system of servitude in the South, which was really the mildest in the world which did not rest on acts of displacement and disenfranchisement, but elevated the African and was in the interest of human improvement, and which by the law of the land protected the Negro in life and limb and in many personal rights and by the practice of the system bestowed upon him a sum of individual indulgences, which made him altogether the most striking type in the world of cheerfulness and contentment, unquote. Uh, you guys appalled? It's pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah, and this is, everybody's reading this, you know, uh, going on. 
Pollard uh, later on changed his mind, but it's too late. By the way, he repented of writing such a book, let's be fair, uh, and he disagreed with himself, but it was too late. Uh, the book was out. Uh, the Lost Cause idea was also out. Uh, writing in the Confederate veteran reader, Manly Curry, worried that the popular presentations of slavery only, only portrayed the dark side, but there really is a bright side. He says, the slaves were happy, enjoyed life with activities like corn chuckings, barbecues, and weddings. <laughs> oh, it's awful. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so then you had others. Uh, basically, a lot of the writers for it happened to be former generals of the Confederacy. Quite a few of them uh, writing about these, uh, creating the false rhetoric. You also have General Jubal A. Early. Uh, he was writing for the Southern Historical Society. Uh, he also said that the lost cost, now they have the word lost cause since 1866 in everybody's uh, language. Uh, he basically uh, saw himself as, quote, an unconstructed rebel, and he only wore Confederate gray cloth for the rest of his life. And he was pardoned by Andrew Johnson. Uh, in his final years, he became an outspoken proponent of white supremacy and believed this as justified by religion. Here we go. And so what he does is now he mixes religion, specifically Protestant belief systems, with the advocacy of racial separation. And he goes on about the facts. Uh, if you want me to read this, I'll read one more. And of course, then I'll just... And, uh, you know, then I'll throw up in my mouth here. Here we go, one more here. Uh, he says, um, he, he characterized former slaves, quote, as barbarous natives of Africa, considering them in a civilized and Christianized condition as a result of their enslavement. He says the creator of the universe has stamped them with a different color and inferior physical and mental organization. Okay, I can't even read more. This is awful. Okay, you get the point. He goes on, he uses Christianity as a, as a support of racism. It's a very long quote, and I'm um, getting too upset. Okay, moving right along, then you have an academic society created called the Southern Historical Society, founded April 15, 1869. And it, it's, what it did is it created the other perspective from the academic side, but always used rhetorically to support the idea that the issue was not at all slavery, but states' rights. Let's just keep saying it over and over again until people believe that. Does that sound familiar? They, so they kept saying states' rights, states' rights, states' rights. And then, of course, you're going to have somebody by the name of, well, yes, um, um, here we go. Um, Trying to find the note here. Uh, uh, well, I can't find the notes, but it's fine. Um, his name is Jefferson Davis. You guys ever heard of him? Anyway, Jefferson Davis, Davis decided to publish a series of works on the Confederacy showing the just perspective. Uh, he published this in the 1870s. And again, he focused on the idea of states' rights, states' rights. And he, again, would be in a position to have some kind of authority from the perspective of those people living there. Well, it gets even worse. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Now that I just said it anyway. Then another group that formed called the United Confederate Veterans, they formed in 1889. They also had these get-togethers uh, of, of former veterans to talk about the wonderful aspects of the Civil War. But the most powerful of all, they're called the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And I'm glad we actually got to this point, even though we have four minutes left. I'm going to go a little over, but you want to hear this. The United Daughters of the Confederacy, they formed in 1894. And they came up with this, this great idea, uh, even though you saw this uh, as, as, as conducted by the United Confederate Veterans, they started to put little monuments up in towns. The United Daughters of the Confederacy decided to make this a policy, that in every southern town, there should be a monument to those chivalric, wonderful men who fought for our lost cause. They are the ones who are larger, largely responsible for those uh, statues that people are arguing about taking down uh, throughout the South right now. 
They're the ones who supplied the money. They're the ones who put it up. Uh, daughters of the Confederacy stated their goal to tell of the glorious fight against all odds a nation ever faced, that their hollowed memory should never die. They formed a group to, to indoctrinate their children to the cause. They're called the Ch Children of the Confederacy that was formed in 1896. Is this appalling? And so uh, what happened is the United Daughters of the Confederacy, they're responsible for starting the, the giant stone carving of Davis, Lee, and Jackson upon Stone Mountain, as well as the majority of other statues sprinkled about the South. The majority of the statues that we see of various Confederate leaders today, in Southern Town Squares that appear between 1894 and 1920 were set up by them. They were intended to teach via these Southern virtuous men so with good Southern values to express the idea that the great cause was worth defending and fighting for, inclusive of what they call the Southern way of life, unquote, which included the institution of slavery. They are still around today and still supporting the same ideas to the point where uh, Princeton University, James McPherson, talked against them and got himself lots of hate mail as an academic. Uh, they're very strong, very powerful. Another group that formed in 1896 that continues the same indoctrination, they're called the Sons of the Confederate Veterans. They are formed in 1896. They got themselves into a whole bunch of situations in the 1990s uh, about, the, about the, the Confederate flag. And they're the ones who are also still organizing uh, uh, I would say various protests in the South right up to 2020. This is interesting. All coming out of this movement. Uh, you can see now what will happen. I, I don't have time for, for too much else, but I can, I can surely summarize. I can say that um, what will happen is this Southern mythos will continue into uh, the 19 teens and 1920s. Uh, unfortunately, you have Wilson who does create uh, a, a, a segregation within the federal level, saying that you know you know should be you know equal, uh, but separate uh, within the federal context. Uh, you're going to have uh, a lot of people who are angry that uh, African Americans are fighting uh, in World War One, even though they're they're separate units. And in fact, in order to bring Southerners to, get, to connect with the World War I, he decided a good way of publicizing that and getting people to want to recruit even before there's a draft is why don't we name some of these camps after Confederate soldiers? That will bring them in. So if you take a look at the dates, you realize that the, the, those that are named after Confederate uh, generals you take a look at the names and you'll realize the dates, you'll realize very quickly that, hey, wait a second, it's all during World War I and during World War II. That's right. And once again, uh, you're going to have this constant fight tug, uh, tug of war. Um, and then, of course, uh, unfortunately, all these ideas come about that are put in the book in 1936 that's called Gone with the Wind. And the this, this sense of the South is then recreated. Uh, again, the idea of an idyllic uh, life using the plantation myth. And of course, these ideas uh, seem to uh, grow in the South, especially during the civil rights movements of the 1950s and 1960s, and unfortunately, the 2020s. I want you to think about that. For a few moments. So we are definitely fighting those who seem to be favoring this idyllic lost cause, but at the very root of this idea is the subjugation and prejudicial treatment of African Americans. And it is, and I think I've demonstrated this, very much entrenched in the culture of the United States especially the South, and we need to address this issue. Thank you. So do my picture of everybody here.
You guys want to turn on your screen? Yay! So, so let's get everybody here. Yay! And then we'll. Okay, is that, is there everybody? Okay, one, two, and three. Okay, well, I covered a lot, and I actually didn't cover it all. I'm on page 46, <laughs> uh, 55 pages. I go right into the uh, uh, Roosevelt and, and, and Truman and Eisenhower. But um, I think I made my point. Uh, you can see how entrenched this idea is. You can see uh, what the South really was and what they made the South look like in the end. You, know, you can see exactly how it was mastered, but you can also see that so much of this is based upon slavery. If somebody comes up to you and says, hey, it's a war between the states, it's over state rights. I think I gave enough information for you to know it's not states' rights, it is slavery, and it's based upon the prejudicial uh, treatment of, of course, African Americans. Uh, I could have given you even more information, and I had it, but I, I hit the mountain peaks, so to speak. But uh, there's a lot here, and I hope I helped illuminate uh, these issues on many different levels. Any questions? Hey, I'll have some orange juice. Oh. Um, I have a question. Yeah. On what basis do you say that John Brown necessarily made things worse? I mean, I know he inflamed tensions, but I don't think the tensions were going anywhere. Well, he what had happened? Yeah. What happened is is what he did in Kansas, as opposed to Harper's Ferry, although Harper's Ferry, which I've actually been to Harper's Ferry uh, before, where a group uh, that wanted to you know, took over a federal <laughs> munitions post. <laughs> um, uh, what happened is he did kill a few people who uh, were not necessarily pro-slavery. Uh, so he was not, he was kind of, he was a pretty wild character that um, he hurt the cause, even though he was supportive of it. Uh, so something, I know, you know, old John Brown's body have all these wonderful songs and they sing the songs during the, the Union soldiers sing this and he became kind of like this tragic hero type. This is all about, <clears throat> this is now about the union mythos that's being created. So he becomes a hero for the point of the South, of the North, excuse me. <clears throat> he became the bane of the South. But uh, uh, he really did, uh, he really did much more damage than he should have. That helps. Yeah. Anybody else? Thanks for this, James. You know, I'm sorry, sorry I was kind of late to the party, but, uh, and, and if you covered this already, let me know and we can sort of chat individually on that. But, you know, just, you know, this antebellum period is so fascinating at so many levels because it just leads to this death and destruction. Um, and I think about, if we think globally, right, there was a real movement toward, um, abolition of slavery, in, particularly in the West. You know, you've got um, France eradicating slavery, England in the, what, the 40s, 1840s, 1830s, somewhere around there, Germany getting rid of it, um, the northern states abolishing it. Um, and, I'm, and I just try to think of, you know, what other country fought a war over slavery and I can really only think of the United States, right? That yeah. actually fought the war over slavery, which was a dying institution anyway. I, I, I mean, you know, you, you, you can't imagine slavery, if there was no civil war, slavery going into the 20th century, right? I mean, it's, I, I, I just, so, so I guess my question is, is how do we, how do we understand the United States as a place where it becomes a battle where so many people die over this rather than being able to work it out somehow. Because I remember, you know, even Lincoln, uh, you may have covered this, you know, Lincoln was very slow to abolitionism, right? You know, Frederick Douglass really criticized him at many, many levels saying, you know, mm -hmm. He's very slow. And then Lincoln even said, you know, if I can uh, save the Union by, you know, freeing all the slaves, I would, freeing no slaves, I would, freeing half mm -hmm. the slaves. Um, but it ended up being this terrible war 
Um, what is it you think about America at this time and maybe even going into now that it resorts to violence in order to, um, to, to kind of solve this issue? Um, I know it's a big question, but, but uh, it, that makes, I mean, America unique in terms of solving its slavery problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, it's, 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 it's an excellent question, and, and so many different levels to it. Um, I would say that the, uh, I, brought, I brought a little bit about this earlier, is that the South did not want to change. They had an opportunity to diversify. Uh, in the, eight, uh, the 1790s, they could have been more industrialized. They could have changed their way of life. Uh, but as opposed to doing that, you have the cotton gin that is discovered, and they go right from tobacco uh, to uh, to cotton, and they and those who are wealthy become more wealthy and become more protective of their manner of life and their existence. And unfortunately, you have a stratification because those who are poor become even poorer who are not slaves, and you have the wealthy now very much invested in this Gentile ideal, uh, this Camelot, this, this chivalric realm of, of the, if they see, see themselves, excuse me, see themselves as, you know, you'll connect with this as almost Roman aristocracy with their, Latin, you know, their, 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 their wealthy, privileged life, and they want to defend that. So there's this feeling of I am so conservative, I don't want to change my way of life. At all costs, I want to defend it. And it became an ideal, but it also became a rhetorical mythos, even in the South. What I didn't bring up is that even though you have the dreams of the beautiful South, uh, you know, after the Civil War, you still had those dreams even before the war, even though they weren't actually experiencing it. So you're going to have a poor farmer white farmer who has nothing going, ah, oh, but someday I will become wealthy and I'll have lots of slaves and I'll, I'll, I'll participate within this ideal. And this rhetoric of this way of life was so strong that, of course, John C. Calhoun talked about their peculiar institution. It was worth fighting for because this is the way we are and it is uh, a, a way of life has moral cultivation and um, you know, we are, in a sense, uh, nobles. Uh, and I, I'm answering your question, I think I am. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. It's, it's just a, it's just such a tragedy because the writing was on the wall already, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, the movement was toward abolition. Um, and uh, eventually, as you explained very well, the, the South sort of reinstituted this uh, in sort of, you know, the... Um, you know, the various laws about um, misogyny and uh, getting to get, um, you know, mixing and, you know, segregation becomes important and the, and, and violation of, uh, of their rights to actually vote and taking that, all that stuff away. Uh, because, of course, the, those, those other countries that, that abolished slavery still certainly treated uh, ethnic minorities terribly still, but they didn't have to kill thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to do, to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but but it, it just shows me that there's this real knee-jerk reaction in the United States to resort to violence uh, so quickly rather than uh, trying to negotiate and work things out and compromise, you know, in, in, in some ways. Um, so it's 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 just like a dark stain, you know, on on American culture that keeps coming back. You know, yeah, yeah. Of course, toward violence. We're so reactionary. Did I see a question from Susan Anderson, or I thought I saw a hand right? Yes. I can't hear you. The microphone. Turn on. The microphone. There. Yeah. I really have two questions. The first question is that I have read on several occasions that the attitude of states' rights was not peculiar to the South. Indeed, that the state of New York or Maine or one of the others prior to the Civil War had threatened secession on the basis of uh, states' rights. Yes. Is, is that yes. correct? 
that that is that is very correct. And um, in, in fact, uh, uh, the idea of secession was an open conversation that was not fully addressed even with the Constitution. So yes, uh, no, no, that's right. What what's what the situation was uh, in uh, obviously 1832 was separation based upon the support of the peculiar institution in connection to the tariff law. So, so, so yes, so absolutely. Uh, other people, other states have threatened to secede. In this case, uh, I was looking at it as a, as a precursor to the civil war in reaction to, uh, to, to slavery, but yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of ideas when it comes to the centralization of the federal state occur as a result of the civil war. Could and I, it really did put the rest of that question. That's an excellent question, by the way. Thank you. Could I follow on with one quick question? I've sure. also been under the impression that there were the slaves, the few that there were in the North were not released at the same time uh, as the slaves in the South. Is there any truth to that? Okay, so to answer that question is that this, the slaves that were in the border states that had sided with the Union, those slaves were released after the slaves were released in the South by way of the troops covering those areas and conquering the Southern territories. And then of course, obviously the slaves being released as a result of that. So the answer is again, yes, uh, you're gonna have the, but it is the border states. No, Thank you. Maryland, yeah, yeah. Very good. Great question. May I Love chime it. in? This yes, is a friend. Okay. Huh? Uh, you know, uh, in, in the chat, uh, Dorian had a really interesting quote from Abraham Lincoln that um, I think Dennis also brought up and it was about how <clears throat> he preferred keeping the union together. And yes. if you could do that without freeing the slaves, um, that very controversial quote. I think it's important to play devil's advocate, you know, um, because there are, especially in this time, people <clears throat> trying to, you know, reinforce this. Uh, reinforce this really backwards narrative and uh, if we can kind of get behind um, get get ahead of some of those you know kind of damning quotes or at least on the surface level damning quotes you know uh, and something that the last questioner just brought up like oh didn't the northern states you know re release slaves technically after the southern states oh so really the southern states were about <laughs> state rights they were in fact they're the first ones to you know so I, I can just see um, <clears throat> people using all those kind of in a really dishonest way um, do you have, um, you know, do you have any like quick fire ones or if you run into any sure, talking sure. with people that you can um, inform yeah. us on and advise us how to respond to? Yeah, no, that's actually, that's, that's, that, okay. So, so the best way to look at it is during the, uh, the uh, Douglas Jefferson debate, sorry, Jefferson, hopefully not, Douglas Lincoln debates, uh, you're going to have Abraham Lincoln looks, uh, I would say, you know, he's, 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 even though he loves Webster and he agrees with Union for all, he seems not fully in support of, uh, he wants to find an answer to slavery. He even brings up the idea of sending slaves to Africa during these debates. This is before he was president. So the best way to answer the question is, you gotta see Lincoln as a person who evolves through time. His views change dependent upon when you see Abraham Lincoln. And he always moves towards more and more to the absolute freedom of slaves. And you're gonna see that between the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment of, of, in February of 1865. You're gonna see between 1863 and 1865, President Lincoln changes his views on slavery. And so the best answer is if we have the Abraham Lincoln as we had him uh, uh, in 1864, 1865, he would be absolutely uh, against the institution of slavery. He was against it before, but more and more, he found it as a moral imperative and, and found it was the moral right uh, of the union to get rid of this, but it was a gradual process. So, so we can't vilify Lincoln uh, based upon an earlier sayings of his life. We have to see what kind of person Abraham Lincoln was uh, at the very end. 
And that person was, of course, uh, very much against slavery, which was clever between the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment was February 1865. It's a sealed deal. And he lost his life based on that. You know, John Wilkes Booth was there in the audience. That's that's decision was made. So the die was cast. He lost the Rubicon. You know, <laughs> you know, he's you know he he uh, that was the point of no return. And uh, John Wilkes Booth says he's you know in the audience is okay. That's the moment when we decided the conspiracy uh, would take place. And uh, my dad always laughs when he talks about that. He just can't believe, you know, how you know how ridiculous that this person's thought uh, enacted such a terrible conspiracy that resulted from it. But, uh, yeah, Abraham. So that was a, yeah. I hope that does answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really fantastic response and so detailed and informed. I think it's important to know the, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly about uh, our heroes so that we can yes. def defend them. You know, uh, like I say, get, get ahead of people trying to say, oh, well, you think Abraham Lincoln is, you know, Jesus H. Christ, you know, he's like the best thing since ever, you know, well, look how bad he was, you know. So if we're, we're already ahead of those facts and we understand that, I mean, these people were people, I mean, like you said, Thomas Jefferson, right? He owned a crap ton of slaves and he never freed them. Well, now we know why he never freed them. And that so was, people can't just- I didn't know that, did you? No. Yeah, that was, that's fantastic. That was, yeah, this blew my mind. Um, it wasn't his fault. He was like, well, I could do what I want, but you know, I could sign a piece of paper. It wouldn't have any, wouldn't have any like legal merit that the creditors on these people now. And that's, that's freaking awful to, to, you know, kind of say it in those blatant terms, but that's, that's the real deal, you know? Yeah. And I think that's why historians, I know Dennis, uh, and I brought up this issue a little earlier. Um, but yeah, that's why historians need to get the information out. You know, we need to get this, we need to talk about, we, need, we, we don't need to idolize our heroes. We got to see them as humans. We also have to always see them from the context of their time. We, we, we can't, you know, judge completely 2020 uh, from our perspective. We can't put them on trial uh, in early 2020. I mean, now, I got to watch it turn 2020 because now it doesn't mean the end of the year, but I mean, 2020 vision. <laughs> but we can't, Put them exactly, on top yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and 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 think that they're going to fit our cultural construct. They're never going to measure up. None of our heroes will ever measure up. They're all they're all all fallible. I, I you know I mean I love Penny Roosevelt. Oh, I came across some quotes I didn't bring up today, and he is very prejudiced. <laughs> it's it's pretty awful. Woodrow Wilson. Oh, he had some bad days uh, there too. And uh, uh, although he did. Uh, show the birth of a nation in the capital. You know, ooh, 1915, it's an exciting movie. He didn't like the movie. That was good. Let's show the Ku Klux Klan as the good guys. Um, he didn't approve of that, but at the same time, he was very prejudicial. Uh, those presidents during the 1920s, he said some pretty scary things like Harding. So, you know, of course, I guess nobody's going to say Harding's your, your, your hero, but certainly Teddy Roosevelt is for many of us. And Woodrow Wilson, Hello, League of Nations, anyone? I mean, he's kind of a heroic person, but uh, this prejudice is unfortunately ingrained. We're going to figure out how we how we excavate and and free ourselves uh, from this, this this sense of prejudice that seems to be so deeply embedded uh, in our nation. And you can see it, the roots are really deep, and almost an institution, especially in the South. Um, and I just want to add too, you know, Lincoln was a pretty shrewd politician, right? And in order to be elected in 1860, he could not have run on a platform of being an abolitionist. And I'm wondering if there's any indication in, in some of his journals or early writings that he was kind of uh, already awoken to that before he makes this evolution? Or do we need to take his um, words at face value that he's he's just not he doesn't really care so much about slavery. He really just wants to preserve the union. That's an amazing question. It, it, it bothered him. I think of all things, the little giant, uh, Douglas, is, and, and during their debates, really got him, and they talked about the black, the, you know, the, the, well, they used the word Negro question, sorry. That's and uh, they talked about that. And uh, Douglas 
uh, Stephen Douglas was a little ahead in his perspectives. And I think it caused Abraham Lincoln to really think. And I think, uh, yeah, Dennis, I think by 1859, he's, he's going, you know what? I think that he was already on board and against slavery, but he was politically shrewd. And he knew that in the elections uh, going to 1860, that he couldn't, he couldn't look. He was afraid of the radicals. Uh, he was afraid of the real radical abolitionists. And I think that he may have been a little bit more fair and a little bit more balanced, but there was a person that ruined everything for that. And we're back to Don Brown. <laughs> so this is what a radical abolitionist looks like. And that was, he was, he was like the, the scary dragon to the South. And so Abraham Lincoln and a lot of more centralist politicians decided well, we gotta be more careful about this. And um, that would be a great book. I write a, write a book of what all Don Brown did. <laughs> I would absolutely adore a comparative history of all of the abolitionist movements on all in all the you know countries during that entire time, from the first and recent recorded history to the very very most recent. I think Dorian um, as well. He's really contributing a lot to the chat. Mentioned that Saudi Arabia didn't outlaw slavery till like eighty two, like nineteen eighty two. Yeah, I think that would be a, a great venture. Yeah. Years ago, I published a magazine, and the entire issue was on religion and slavery. So, but uh, it would be nice to have a, a book on that. I think, Dennis, I think you contributed to that. So, but yeah, um, I, I did a piece on Paul, I think. Uh, yeah, the Apostle Paul and slavery. Paul and slavery, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, by the way, we're going back to religious roots. In fact, um, uh, yeah, there was a fight, and uh, this is where we get Baptists and Southern Baptists. <laughs> uh, uh, there, was a, there was a fight in the Baptist Convention uh, over parts of Scripture. And so uh, Philemon, you know, and yeah, the idea is, you know, are we sending, is he being sent back as a slave and he stays a slave? Or is he being sent back and he gets to stay and he's free as a brother, you know? And so the, the North said, well, obviously he's free as a brother. And the South said, no, 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 he's still a slave. He just recognizes a brother in Christ. And they fought about this during the Seventh, uh, Civil War. And of course, we, we get the, uh, the Baptist split over it. Part, it's one of the questions they say, okay. <laughs> and unfortunately, the Southern Baptists are the ones who said, hey, uh, <clears throat> uh, he's still a slave. Okay, so moving right along. <laughs> so, but we do unfortunately find that this is another important part is that the institution of slavery and the attitudes of prejudice are so ingrained within the white churches, the South, in the antebellum period. Very ingrained. And unfortunately, that institutionalized slavery within the church continued uh, after, um, after uh, Reconstruction. Uh, you know, the ladies, you know, the ladies I just talked about, the Confederacy, you know, they, people love them at church. They're still around. But uh, during the 18, uh, 1890s, and, and they, they, they gave tons of money to the church, and they had all these wonderful programs to help children and, and orphans and widows, and they, they, didn't, just, they didn't just put up uh, statues of Confederate soldiers. Uh, they went about and did other, you know, the good things. So people loved them. I mean, they were, you know, they were the, you know, uh, they were very popular. And same thing when it goes to the, the sons of the Confederacy, you know, uh, they were, and they still are, uh, you know, you know, they're, they're, they're pastors and ushers and elders and, ooh, and now we're going to scary territory again. <laughs> so what do we do with all this information? That's why I told you I thought it'd be a little vague towards the end here, but you're getting the idea. There, there, it is really entrenched. How do we get rid of this overnight? Uh, yeah. No, it's not overnight. I know. I mean, how do we? How do we? You know, we have so many. We have so many years of of, of these entrenched ideas, you know, and it's it's really you know you see it in the South in the police force, you see it in the in the church, religion mixed in, you know, you know, constitution. constitution. New government. Constitution? <laughs> they don't have a constitution, you know? Yeah. 
We're supposed to make a decision by 1808. That didn't happen. Although, you know, Jefferson didn't get rid of slavery in 1808. It was importation of slavery, I should say. Did that. That's all he could really do. He wanted, he wanted the he wanted the institution to end so he could free his own slaves. You understand the debt rules. But, um, anybody else? No? All right. Not sure if, did you guys have fun? Uh, is the right word for it. <laughs> Very informative. Yes. Uh, yes. Hopefully it was, it was informative. Yes. Uh, and, and helpful. Yes. And, um, <laughs> No, like I said, any more questions? I'm open for it. Otherwise, no. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Okay. All right, here we go. All right.